A warm welcome to everyone here today for our panel event, Advancing Climate Change and Humanitarian Action. And today we're, we're celebrating African women's leadership. My name is Nelly Kamau, and I'm a student in the MPP program at UBC School of Public Policy and Global Affairs. I am also the graduate academic assistant for the Liu Institute Network for Africa. Before going further, I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge the ancestral, traditional, and unceded lands of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Slave Watu people on which Vancouver residents live, work, and study. As Africans in the diaspora community and non-Africans interested in Africa, Lena is conscious of the legacy of colonialism on these lands and will continue to support the discourse on decolonization. Given the virtual format of today's event, I invite you to take a moment to reflect on the indigenous lands that you are on and perhaps share with us in the chat where you're dialing in from or tuning in from. So let me give you maybe a few seconds to do that and perhaps uh, engage with us in the chat uh, section uh, about where you're coming from. A couple of housekeeping notes as you do so. This event is co-hosted by the Lu Institute Network for Africa and the Collective for Gender Plus in Research housed at the Office of Regional and International Community Engagement. Uh, and they're all housed within UBC's School of Public Policy and Global Affairs. This event will be recorded and shared afterwards as well. We will be taking questions from you, the audience, later in the programming through the Zoom Q&A button. Now let's get straight on to it. As, you, as many of you know, March is Women's History Month, a unique period that marks women's historical and contemporary achievements across the world. In line with this, this is a significant impetus for gender equality, and this women's African Women's Leadership Series celebrates African women's outstanding contributions and examines the prevailing challenges that still require intensified investments for change to empower women. Today, you're in for a treat from three generations of African women who are breaking the bias in climate change and humanitarian action starting with our moderator, Elsabi Boshoff. I'll introduce her quickly to you. And she's a doctoral, doctoral fellow at the Norwegian Center for Human Rights at the University of Oslo. Her research focuses on the right to sustainable development as an emerging human right in the African human rights system. She's interested in human rights issues related to environment, sustainable development, extractive industries, and transitional justice. Her primary focus, of course, is the African context. El Sabi has worked with the African Commission on Human and People's Rights and is co-editor of an edited volume, Governance, Human Rights and Political Transformation in Africa. Without further ado, welcome El Sabi. Thank you very much, Nelly, for that kind introduction. Um, and also very welcome from my part for, from, uh, to everyone joining us from different parts of the world. And in particular, a warm welcome to our esteemed guests. Thank you so much for making time in your schedules to sit down with us today uh, to discuss your work and important issues related to climate justice. I will introduce our speakers properly in a minute, uh, but let me first say a few words about the topic of today's event. Advancing climate justice and humanitarian action, celebrating African women's leadership. We live in what has been called the Anthropocene, an age of human-induced change to the planet's biosphere. Climate change, biodi biodiversity loss, and pollution at a global scale are threatening our very existence as humanity on this planet. And those who are the least responsible for these crises 
are the ones who will suffer the most and who already started suffering the consequences from this destruction. The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, IPCC, a report on climate change impacts, adaptation and vulnerability, released in February of this year, noted that food insecurity, malnutrition, and lack of access to safe drinking water have all increased on the African continent due to climate change related floods and droughts. Inequality and poverty are also constraints to climate change adaptation and worsen these consequences, leading to humanitarian crises with West, Central and East Africa having become global hotspots of high human vulnerability. Women are not only a marginalized group bearing the brunt of the impacts of climate change, they also continue to face barriers and challenges in accessing resources and being included in leadership and decision-making positions. Despite this, there are African women of all generations and from different backgrounds who have taken the lead in the fight against climate change and its consequences in their communities, countries, on the African continent, and also internationally. As Nelly said, we celebrate Women's Month, um, and today we have two wonderful women with us, trailblazing leaders in environmental issues, uh, who come from different backgrounds and generations, but who are united in their passion for climate justice. We are here to celebrate their outstanding contributions on our continent and also on the world stage. We look forward very much to learning from your experience and also to get some advice for, from you um, as well for young and aspiring climate leaders and change makers um, in Africa. In terms of the program for today, I. Uh, will introduce both of the speakers, after which they will each have the opportunity to speak about their work for about 15 minutes. Thereafter, we will have a moderated discussion for about 20 minutes, and then there is an opportunity for a Q&A, as Nelly has also mentioned. So we really encourage all of you to send us your questions, uh, which we can then pose to the panelists. In total, the program will be for about an hour and a half. With that, I would now like to introduce our wonderful speakers. The first panelist is Ms. Joyce Msuya from Tanzania. She is the Assistant Secretary General of the United Nations for Humanitarian Affairs. Having been appointed to this position by the UN Secretary General from February, 2022. And she is also the Deputy Emergency Relief Coordinator in the UN Office for the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs, OCHA. OCHA has more than 2,000 staff across 60 countries and is responsible for bringing together humanitarian organizations to ensure a coherent and timely response to emergencies. She has more than 20 years experience in international development and finance with diverse assignments in Africa, Asia, and Latin America. Since 2018, she served as Deputy Executive Director of the UN Environmental Program in Nairobi, Kenya. And between 2018 and 2019, she was UNEP's Interim uh, Executive Director. She has also held several leadership roles at the World Bank Group, and has a background in microbiology and environmental science. Our second speaker is Professor Margaret Okorodudu Fubara from Nigeria. She has been called a founding mother of environmental and climate justice research and teaching in Africa. And her long and illustrious career really stretches back to the birth of the field of environmental law in the 1970s and 80s. She obtained a master's degree from the University of London and then a further master's degree and a PhD from Harvard in 1977 and 1980, respectively. She is really a woman who has been shattering the glass ceiling 
having been the first woman professor of law at a federal university in Nigeria, the first professor of environmental law in the ECOWAS region, and first and to date only female dean in her faculty. Professor Okoradudu Fubara chairs Environmental Rights Action, Africa's foremost environmental organization, and pioneered MESA, which stands for Mainstream Environment for Sustainable Development into African Universities, a UNEP initiative in education for sustainable development in all tertiary institutions. She retired from academia last year. So thank you both very much for being here with us today. And we really look forward to learning from your experiences and wisdom uh, as you share with us your journey in climate justice. So I would like to first give the floor to Joyce Msuya. Um, please, you have the floor and you have 15 minutes. Thank you very much. Uh, can you hear me, El Sabe? Great. Uh, thank you very much, uh, El Sabe, for a very kind introduction. Uh, let me also uh, recognize uh, my fellow panelists, uh, Professor Okoroduru Fubara. Uh, good to see you again online. I want to first express my deepest thanks to the organizers for this uh, event. Uh, thank you, Nelly, as well, for uh, opening up uh, the session. Um, my deepest thanks to the students from all over the world, the faculty, and everybody who has connected. Um, it is a very special uh, session for me, El Sabe, if I could say so. I have just taken up this new role uh, in Ocha. Uh, working on humanitarian, but also looking at how, for example, the climate change is actually driving, impacting, or linked to humanitarian uh, crisis. And prior to this, uh, as you mentioned, El Sabe, I was in UNEP. But why this event is important is because in 1997, I actually worked at then the Liu Center for Global Studies. So in many ways, uh, the Liu Institute spearheaded the career that I have had thus far. And I have not had a chance to give back to the center, to the Institute that has given so much to me. Uh, and it's not just to me, but also my husband is a graduate of UBC and so is my daughter. So I want to thank the UBC community for shaping um, uh, who I have become uh, professionally. Now, let's get straight uh, to the point. Uh, this topic is very, very timely. Uh, El Sabe, you mentioned the most recent IPCC report, uh, which actually said 3.3 billion to 3.6 billion people nearly half of the world's population live in climate change hotspots. And having just moved to New York from uh, Kenya, uh, I also know from UNEP's perspective as well, if you look at the emissions gap report, the global environmental outlook, Africa gets disappropriately, disappropriately affected by the global emissions. It is one of the regions that is worst affected by climate crisis, despite it being one of the smallest contributor to the problem. But what is of interest and what gives me hope is the kind of work that Professor Okorodudu, Fubara, and also many unsung women heroes on the ground that I met that are working on climate justice, that are leading on climate justice, including from the villages. And what I have learned from my experience, uh, for example, in Kenya and beyond, is the fact that communities may not articulate the problems they're facing, whether it's the low river, 
water volumes that feeds into the agriculture as climate justice, but most of the brunt of the climate change impact does tend to affect women. Uh, if you think about uh, deforestation or the impact of drought, food crisis, uh, the role that women play in the communities, in the household, uh, does tend to be largely affected by it. But I have also seen the powerful stories of women across Africa that are actually taking charge. Uh, Mathai, uh, who actually did quite a lot of work in Kenya, the late uh, uh, Wangari is one example, but there are many Wangaris across the continent that may not be recognized, but they do actually contribute to finding the solution. And one example that I want to give you actually comes from the coastal area of Eastern Africa, uh, the Indian Ocean, um, where some of the initiatives that the United Nations have worked very closely with uh, were driven by women who observed the plastic pollution along the coastal area, which was getting into the fish that the women were cooking for their families. And they initiated uh, a plastic pollution marine litter uh, cleaning exercises amongst small communities along Zanzibar, Mombasa, Kilifi, and other parts of East Africa. So clearly there is leadership at that level. There is a recognition of what climate change looks like. And there is climate justice, even at, at the community level, even though it may not be articulated at the international level. I also want to speak to the links between climate justice and development. As the participants know well, as you know well, very well, El Sabe, the story of African development is also linked, for example, to the agriculture sector, uh, to food security, to food systems. So the risks of not addressing uh, climate change, climate justice issues, the inaction, possible inaction has a direct impact as well on the long-term uh, uh, development of most African countries. Think about basic services provision, access to education for girls who are the future uh, women leaders of Africa and what climate change may or may not do. So how do we move from climate injustice to climate equity? I would like to cite a statement from the United Nations Secretary General Antonio Guterres uh, that he gave on 17th of March. And I quote him, he says, least developed countries did not cause the climate crisis, but they are living with its worst impacts. They need a massive boost in support to build climate resilience and spark a just transition to renewable energy and green jobs, end of quote. The recognition here is that there is, the climate crisis does affect people, communities very differently. Poor people uh, lack safety nets that middle income and upper income countries do have. So think about the rippling effect of not having uh, safety nets for majority of African countries and what that could potentially do to the youth and uh, the future generation of Africa. But there are some good stories. It's not all gloomy. Uh, civil society, we are seeing governments taking charge of actually uh, driving uh, solutions, but also addressing the climate change impact. If you look at the NDCs, the Africa uh, region leads in actually completing 
the formulation of NDCs. That is one part of the story. Now equally important is the implementation and funding of the implementation of those NDCs. We're also seeing youth uh, playing a, a massive role in pushing world leaders to actually uh, act on climate change. So for me, if I could summarize African women uh, leading the charge against the climate crisis. There are a lot of good examples, as I've mentioned before, from community level all the way up, but clearly more needs to be done. Uh, women, we also have climate scientists, environmental specialists, like Professor that we will hear uh, from her very soon, as well as community leaders, lawyers, and private sector non-state actors that are uh, involved in fighting climate change. But also we do know sometimes women do not have the voice when it comes to shaping the climate policy. So the discussion of climate justice is also thinking about access for women leaders to actually influence the justice as well as the policy sides of the uh, uh, problem. Lastly, um, I want also to just say climate, if I look at South Sudan, uh, a country where my previous entity, uh, UNEP, used to have projects, there are links between climate drivers for humanitarian crisis. If you look at some of the drought around Kenya, Tanzania border or the Eastern African and how the pastoral communities and the Maasai uh, community, for example, move back and forth. And sometimes there may be conflict. Uh, in the case of South Sudan, the humanitarian um, challenges do seem to have impact with the uh, drought and climate change uh, impact of the community. So the area, uh, the links, between climate crisis, climate drivers that drives humanitarian crisis, just focusing on Africa are there. And here in Ocha, we are trying to understand the facts and the science behind it, but also looking at some of the good examples where these two areas have actually been successfully addressed. So with that, let me hand over the floor back to you, El Sabi, over to you. Thank you so much, Joyce, uh, for this presentation, which clearly shows um, the passion with which you do your job. Uh, you reminded us that women not only bear the brunt of climate change, but that they also drive important climate initiatives on the ground, even if it is not acknowledged as such. Um, if I can ask one quick follow-up question before we go on. Uh, you spoke about your start at the Liu Institute, um, but did you from that point already know that you wanted to work for the UN, for the World, World Bank, work on environmental issues? Uh, how did you come to choose this path? Thank you, El Sabe. So, you know, uh, I've had a bit of uh, unconventional professional journey, uh, as I would call it myself. Uh, I actually, I was trained as a scientist. Uh, I studied biochemistry and immunology in Scotland. And then I went to University of Ottawa to do basic research in the lab in microbiology and immunology. This was the time when uh, HIV AIDS was becoming a real public health problem, particularly in Africa. So my desire, my aspiration was to go and try and address HIV AIDS. And then I crossed over to Liu Center for Global Studies. I think the Liu Center for Global Studies shaped three things in my life. One is it provided me with a nexus of the hardcore data uh, and research to help inform public health policy. So at the time, one of the first assignments that I had was actually to looking at how uh, transportation like airplanes would act as vehicles for communicable diseases. 
and I was focusing on tuberculosis. So one is the link of data research uh, with public policy. The second is the international spirit that Liu Center, as well as the UBC more broadly, instilled in me. Uh, and I saw the world very differently after moving uh, to Vancouver, which led me to the third point, because from Liu Center uh, global, stu global Studies, I moved to the World Bank to work on uh, uh, health projects, was looking at the multilateral dimension of finding solutions for public health policy. Now, to answer your question, I did not plan, I did not think I would reach uh, uh, where I, I have, but I do believe the strong foundations that I got from new uh, global studies and other academic institutions shaped the way I look at the world and particular multilateral organizations. Over to you. Thank you very much, and for that wonderful testimony to Liu Center um, for the role that they played in, in where you are today. Um, I think then we can go directly on to Prof. Okorududu Fubara. Um, if you would like to share with us your journey, uh, your, your achievements, and what we can learn from your experiences. You have the floor, Prof, and you also have 15 minutes. Thank you very much, El Sobe, for that very kind and generous uh, introduction. It's an incredible honor to be on this panel. And thank you for giving me this uh, platform to advance the cause of um, climate justice and keep the conversation going and active too. And you know, people using their voices, you know, is the most powerful tool that we have to reverse the dwindling fit of uh, um, climate integrity and uh, you know the climate system go governance and entrench a culture of um, of um, climate justice you know in uh, um, in our world let me state up from that um, climate justice is at the very core of the um, global climate change issue and if you get it right then we can rest assured that our world is definitely on the sound footing to resolving 99.9% of this global enigma. And let's face it, global um, climate justice or climate injustice, however I want to term it, is at the very heart and soul, uh, a spirit of the bigger picture we call um, climate change. You know, it sort of pulls people to the problem with passion, you know, uh, to seek a solution of the problem and push towards a goal or survival of man on um, planet Earth. Why do I say this? I think um, the answer to this is um, what I've used my platform. I'm going to my platform, you know, as a teacher, a pedagogue in university over the years, you know, to try and, um, you know, in, uh, if you, you'll be amazed that. Um, Right now, climate change or climate justice sounds more like an elitist issue. Not a lot of people around the world are quite conversant with, you know, the problem of climate change or, or you know, or uh, climate ju justice. And over the years, that's what I've tried to use my platform as a teacher at Panama University to try and spread, and um, they. project, you know, that was an initiative of UNEP, gave me that platform to try a mainstream, you know, um, environment and sustainability in the in um, Nigerian in universities. You, know, you ask yourself, how can people do if they do not know? I believe that there is a strong connect, you know, between education and and um, you know, um, global of uh, uh, climate justice. First of all, I uh, you know I uh, regard myself as a citizen of planet Earth. 
and this is the you know the kind of um, spirit that I try to instill in my st students. As students of Planet Art, we should be committed to preserving this um, one and only planet that can sustain human life. The United Nations uh, Framework Convention on Climate Change clearly, you know, stipulates, you know, um, you know, it's, 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 you know, um, a stand footing for the respective um, responsibilities and capacities for, you know, uh, peoples and countries of the world. And how to achieve climate justice is, that is embedded in the treaty. And we must be our brothers keepers. It's well known that, um, you know, they, they, um, the, the, the most, um, most vulnerable of the earth are those that are considered the least to, um, to global warming or climate change. So how do we ensure that these people, especially the most vulnerable of the planet, are treated fairly? This is what you know. Um, climate justice is all about. My transition to a pedagogy in university gave me this platform to try and you know try and build minds that will fully appreciate what climate justice and injustice means. Because without that, we are not getting anywhere in the, you know with uh, resolving this um, issue of um, climate change. So in the university, um, I taught several courses, including environmental law. And I use the platform also of my valedictory lecture to try and, you know, drive on the connect between education for sustainability and, you know, um, preserving the climate si system. There's a synergy between life and education. Right from childhood or from infancy, we've started learning how to live. You either learn to live or you live to drift. And as a pedagogue and an environmentalist, I'm convinced that it is very important how we learn to live sustainably. Life itself is an unending learning process from cradle to grave. And life pedagogy is at the very core of living sustainably. And sustainably in this is the one and only life is, is, you know, undoubtedly our own learning experience is a powerful tool to check climate um, change at individual, corporate, and societal levels. So it's very important how we learn to live, where we learn to live, and what we learn to live. Education is the foundation of life, and education, whether formal or non-formal, is the building block of life. And let me reiterate that once again, Learning is a life process. Every human being on planet Earth learns in one form or the other. And the form of learning makes a huge difference. So um, I've tried to get to mainstream education and sustainability into Nigerian universities. You know, I, you know of course, I um, met a lot of, um, you know, um, stumbling blocks. And so I had to take the matter to the, um, then the vice president, um, Dr. Billy Jonathan, who himself was previously a university lecturer, to try and see if we could get, you know, um, federal government approval, you know, because you know it will require a lot of logistics and finance to be able to mainstream um, the MESA into Nigerian universities. Um, the, the vice president actually saw the point in the presentation we put to him and he responded by, you know, instructing the then Minister of Education to follow up with our MESA group for the realization of the goals and objectives of MESA in Nigeria. Unfortunately, the MESA Minister of, uh, of, uh, the, the Minister of State for Education did not follow up with us. And we had, we seemed to be on the verge of collapsing, but we continued you know, to try and get, you know, uh, MESA into investors, you know, with the support of the then NUC um, uh, sec secretary. 
But today, Mesa has transformed into uh, GOPES at the global le level. At the Nigerian level, we propose that, you know, um, Mesa transforms into uh, NUPES. And that with that, the dream that Nigeria had to be one of the 20 global superpowers and strongest economies in, by year 2020, which is now passed, can be resuscitated. We have some challenges to mainstreaming um, MESA in Nigerian universities. But I believe that, um, you know, restructuring the teaching, you know, the education system in the university will go a long way in helping to mainstream education for sustainability. And since this is a strong tool to really broaden the minds of people and get them to know, you know, they appreciate the, 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 the context of the art in which they live in. You be, like I said, you'd be amazed that many people do not know what um, global warming or, um, you know, climate change is all about. And take the simple case of uh, forest. In my environmental law class, I'm often as a student, what do you know? I mean, how, how will you define forest? What do you know, you know? Um, and you will be amazed that the definition of forest ranges from um, forest de facto and forest de, de, de jure. And what I try to do is to try and get them to fully appreciate, you know, um, the concept of forest and the world around them. And I tell them, okay, now, Put on your, your mental um, camera and try to take a picture of the world without the forest and tell me what to say. Okay? Try and take a snapshot. Tell me what to say. This is what they call, you know, um, su sustainable education. I try to paint the big picture of planet Earth without its resources. The graphic picture can be very, very, you know, scary. Then okay, and you know the world without is uh, with the without the, the, the forest is so bare, and you now see Mother Earth like a naked woman. I said, oh no, you know the frustration is gradually robbing Mother Earth of her graceful cover, and man cannot through the frustration reduce the graceful Mother Earth to a disgraced uh, status. With this narrative and simple mental exercise and illustration, the students capture the depiction of success, of forest in theory as well as a deeper practical understanding of its importance and bearing on sustainability concepts. Just as that, moreover, that the forests are the natural lungs of the earth as providers of carbon sinks, of mitigation, of climate change, and among the right unquantifiable life sustaining um, valuable from the forest ecosystem. So um, we have to learn to know if they don't learn to know, they cannot learn to do. And hands-on experience is what we need to get, you know, the citizens to better prepared for the life they face, you know, and on, on also, you know, um, to preserve the world as, you know, for the present and future generations. And then also to make better decisions regarding climate change, you know, and, um, The vision of education for emphasizes a holistic interdisciplinary approach to developing the knowledge and skills needed for a sustainable future, as well as changes in values, behavior, and lifestyles that can help to curb the incidence of um, climate change. And this requires us to reorient our education systems, policies, and practices in order to empower everyone, the young and the old, to make decisions and act in culturally appropriate and locally relevant ways to redress the problems that threaten our common future. And in this way, people of all ages can become change agents, which is what I always try, which is what I'm trying, you know, try to impress on the students that they have to be change agents. Get them to fully, you know, appreciate you know, the concept of uh, global warming, climate change, and, you know, the relevance for their continued existence on in art. So in, in, in short, the OAU MESA group, which I, uh, you know, I, um, I, I led, you know, to a large extent, 
was successful. Although we could not disseminate it because of financial and other logistics, um, you know, uh, but, but bottlenecks within the entire country. But then um, in 2006, the regional center for CEDA uh, 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 sponsored international training program on ESD in the higher education. The NUC demonstrated its support for the MESA group and the hosting of the first MESA international conference you know, on environment development and climate change in Africa. Are universities responding? This helped to also sensitize the public, the entire university system there and all the attendees to the concept of, you know, um, climate change. And then the need to, to retool our teaching um, structures and, 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 and systems, okay? And, um, Eventually, I also have to say something about how I transited, you know, into um, an environmental law and um, climate justice uh, pedagogue and, and researcher. In 1987, there was this infamous um, dumping of toxic waste from Italy in Nigeria. And at that time, when this happened, there was no law in the country under which, you know, the culprits could be um, tried to court for the offense because it was not an offense. And under the rule of law, you cannot charge somebody for a law for an offense that was not existent at the time of the commission of the so called offense. So, this was what uh, necessitated a national conference, an international conference. And um, I was approached to write you know, a paper. The paper, you know, I wrote a paper of about uh, 100 and something pages. And I thought at the end of the a conference that oh, this is something I could develop into a book and try and sensitize Nigeria and, 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 uh, and then uh, the, 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 the law faculties to the concept of environmental law. So this led to the, um, to the first book on environmental law in Nigeria, Law of Environmental Protection, Materials and Tech. I was uh, sponsored by, you know, uh, I got two awards then, the Max and Mara Fellowship, World Bank Fellowship, and the Fulbright Award, you know, I came to US there, sat down and wrote the, you know, started working on the book, but I went back home. So I can really study the Nigerian uh, environmental terrain and um, compare writing book. Already, this became, you know, uh, it, 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 it's the first book on environmental law in Nigeria, and it was a useful material for the new uh, lawmakers then, you know, and, and students and NGOs. At its inception, and a lot of people got, you know, um, you know, got their training from this uh, book, and it's called the Introduction of Environmental Law as a Distinct Field of Law in um, African, uh, in 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 Nigerian law fa faculties. And I'm proud to say, I'm happy to say that as we speak, oh, about seventy five percent of my newly formed um, Nigerian um, Forum of uh, law, law Professors. Over seventy-five percent of them, okay, express interest at their field of study, the environmental law, and their special field of study, and uh, this is what you know my initiative has been able to, you know, um, bring forth for the for the, for the nation. And I will say that quite a lot of you know law faculties are now teaching environmental law, and uh, there are a lot of um, you know uh, environmental legal practitioners. A lot of the, uh, you know environmental law experts, and they're now taking the subject even to the uh, to the next level. So, um, uh, Prof, thank you. If I could yeah. interrupt you there, um, I I would love to hear more about this, and I think we will definitely go into many of these issues still as we continue in the discussion. But if you could maybe wrap up in in one minute or so. Okay then. So uh, yes, and um, yes. Well, um, climate leadership, you now have been quite involved too, and climate leadership and both through my, the platform of my, of my, um, my N NGO, the ERA, Environmental Rights Action, one of the leading, you know, um, NGOs in Africa. I'm the current uh, chairperson of that, you know, of that um, organization. And ERA is involved in, in, um, in, it, you know, in uh, to, 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 to ensure and, 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 and also try to make, make sure 
that the government can, you know, fit with its, um, you know, expert indices, as well as its um, declared, you know, net zero, you know, at um, COP26. ERA is um, a champion of gender inclusiveness. I'd like to say that it's not just the chairperson that is a uh, member of the Board of Trustees, but also the DED, the uh, formidable, um, irrepressible, cerebral um, Miriam Bassi is the, is the DED. And um, er ERA, you know, uh, promotes the interest of uh, women. Intersection of climate change and, uh, you know, and humanitarian action, ERA is also there, you know, we push on, you know, in the case of um, uh, humanitarian uh, efforts, you know, ERA also tries to make sure that we can deny the Niger Delta area. We have also made sure that, um, you know, we mobilize uh, our men and the boys and girls, you know, to rise up when, you know, we have incidences of, um, you know, humanitarian um, crisis there. Yes. Um, so, what are we getting it right? And then, is there any uh, green light from Glasgow? I would say yes, it seems as if there is a green light from uh, Glasgow. The COP26 Climate Change Action Conference acknowledged that, and I quote, climate change is the common concern of humankind. And parties to then, when taking action to address climate change, respect, promote, and consider their respective obligations on human rights. The right to health, the right to indigenous people, local communities, migrants, children, persons with disabilities, and people in vulnerable situations, and the right to development, as well as gender equality, empowerment of women, and intergenerational inter equity. This came out from the um, Glasgow Climate Pact of November 2021. This gives us some green light, and I believe that you know, going forward to COP27, we can um, expect that um, you know, the culture of um, climate justice will almost start getting entrained you know, for the interest of um, the human society. Thank you, and I thank you for giving me this platform. Thank you so much, <coughs> Professor Corridudo Fabara. Uh, for sharing with us your journey and really a lifetime of dedication to teaching uh, environmental law in Africa, as well as your involvement in advocacy. Um, the critical role that you mentioned you played in establishing the field of environmental law in Nigeria at a time when there were not really any laws on it. Um, it is really such an immense contribution. Um, you mentioned also that you use your platform as a teacher to mainstream the environment. Was academia always a calling for you? Yeah, that's a dream. I say, I, I, you know, I am, I am uh, um, a dental professor, you know, professor, not, you know. Actually, I was in practice for 10 years. And um, after my PhD from Harvard, um, what are you doing with PhD practicing? This is a you know waste of asset to the nation. And you know, they said, Oh, you should be in the university teaching, you know. And um, I think they got to my dad, and my dad always had that influence on me and said, Yes, my dear, I think you should be in the university teaching and try and build up, you know, because um at that time, you know, um, you know, university students were still at the and you know, <laughs> so it was quite young. And that was what made me to transfer from the courtroom to the classroom. That's why I put it and that, you know. So it's just like a desk that just went, you know, from classroom to the classroom. Great. Thank you so much. Um, I now have a question that I would like to pose to both of our speakers. Um, and it has two parts. So the first question is, what has been your biggest career challenge? Prof, you mentioned some stumbling blocks that there were along the way in mainstreaming um, sustainability in Nigeria. So what is the biggest career challenge that you faced in your work on environmental and climate justice? And secondly, how did you deal with it? So yes. Prof, there is one that is 
more chronic than the, you know, the mainstreaming one. And um, that biggest challenge is the perennial sparing of gas in Nigeria. And you know, gas sparing is heavily implicated in climate change. Nigeria is about, I think the fourth, you know, largest emitter of um, greenhouse gases in the, in, the, in the world. And over the years, you know, using the platform of my NGO, you know, and I'm, 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 I'm a writing, I've always pushed for, you know, um, enforcement, okay, and compliance with the, with the law that, uh, that prohibits um, flooding of gas. But each year, the, the government keeps, you know, shifting the goalpost, shifting the year of, you know, even up till this latest, um, you know, the uh, Petroleum Industry Act. Under the Petroleum Industry Act of 2021, plane of gas was made illegal. But in spite of making it illegal, there were so many, you know, exceptions. So in short, you know, making um, a nonsense of the whole money. So gas very continue. But you won't blame, you know, from the excuse government that the, like, over 90% of the nation's revenue comes from oil, oil, crude oil in Nigeria. So um, I'm looking at it, and this is where I find a disconnect between the PIA, the Personal Industry Act, and the newly passed Climate Change Act. The Climate Change Act was also passed last year. And the Climate Change Act, we are talking about, uh, uh, you know, 20% uncondi un uh, uh, un unconditional and 47% conditional, you know, of um, greenhouse gas emissions. But how will you work this out? If under the PIA, the, the, uh, the oil companies are, you know, allowed to make all these uh, exceptions to, you know, to, um, climate change and, you know, to um, flaring of, um, of, of gas. They have exceptions such as, um, you know, it says on, on if, if, if there's an emergency and exemption, the, the company can give exemptions, you know, and, and exemption is that may be granted by the commission and acceptable safety practice. What is acceptable safe, um, safety practice? And it's also, you know, if it's also required for first startup, who determines this first startup? You know, so, and also for testing. So all these exceptions, they just eat up, it eats up the, you know, the desire to really calm down on, on, um, on gas training. So it seems that the gas training will still be with us for quite mm. a while. So okay. So that has been my major, you know, um, challenge. That this is get even your... with my platform of um, ERA, you know, ERA is strongly against it. In fact, recently ERA had, you know, a, a, a press co conference where, you know, it um, spoke out, called the government out and they said, in fact, we are threatening that eventually we may have to go to court again and try and see, you know, what the courts can do to determine this, this disconnect between the PIA and the Climate uh, Change Act. Hmm. So this is a challenge which was not only an academic challenge, it's also a very real challenge for yes. the people of Nigeria. Um, and you were fighting it also through your advocacy work. Yes. Um, Joyce, if I may ask you the same question. Thank you, El Sabe. I think uh, my biggest challenge when it comes to the work on environmental and climate justice work is around patient, impatience. By nature, I am a very impatient optimist. And if you look at the issues around climate crisis, the issues around climate justice, they take time. They're very uh, multi-compounded. Uh, you need policy, you need uh, context dimensions, you need different actors to come together. Because most of my career, I have worked in multilateral organizations. The beauty about multilateral, every voice counts. Every country has a seat at the table. 
my impatience comes in when I'm trying to converge what the data and science tells us that time is running out, the planet is burning, uh, seeing people, including in field visits that I have done, suffering from both climate change, but also climate justice, and then reflecting on my role, whether I am putting enough speed on the brakes to actually make a difference. How I have addressed those, uh, that biggest challenge for me is really focusing on people. So anything I do on a daily basis, asking myself, am I actually making a difference in someone else's life? Well, that manifests itself, for example, uh, whenever I do official uh, uh, visits to different countries, I make sure I go to visit the most remote part or where there are projects to connect with people, to get a sense of the pulse. And that brings a bit of reconciliation of my own priorities. A specific example, one of my last trips uh, before I left UNEP was actually to India, uh, Gujarat state, in the middle of nowhere in salt pain communities, very, very poor women uh, working with probably one of the oldest uh, female-led local NGO, SIWA, that started as a microfinance uh, entity. And they were actually trying to address the issue of climate justice, climate change, but also poverty reduction. But it was almost eight hours drive out of the city, but that also gave me hope, looking at my background from development, from UNEP, from now humanitarian and academia to say, you know what? There are actually some progress. So. In conclusion, it's the impatience in me that has been the biggest challenge. Over to you. Thank you so much. Um, I think all of us working on climate issues and, and um, social justice issue, issues reach that point where we feel exhausted by the work and wonder if we're really making a difference. Um, and your approach of drawing hope and inspiration from the people whose lives you're impacting I think that is that is a very good approach. And I like your characterization of yourself as an impatient optimist. Um, I think that's, that's really nice. Um, so now a, a positive question to follow the one on challenges. Um, what do you consider your biggest achievement in your career, um, Prof? Yeah, I think I said that earlier on too. Um, Yes, and I'll give him on, the, on that again. My biggest achievement, I think, is the, is the environmental law book, the first environmental law book in the country that I authored. And um, I get the background to that and um, how it has helped to, you know, build generations of, um, you know, environmental lawyers and experts in the country. But this, I think, is some... Um, my biggest achievement and the way to that I've tried to influence, you know, the younger ones and people in general, the more aware of the environment and the more conscious in. Thank you, thank you. Maybe thank you, yes. yeah. what, yeah. Yeah, so you said earlier as well that we have to learn to live sustainably. Um, and that textbook, um, I'm sure, has contributed a lot. Um, if we don't learn to live, we just drift. Mm -hmm. Learn to live, or you drift to live. And that's, you know, that's jo Thank you. Uh, Joyce, your biggest achievement to date. Thank you. You know, it's very hard. I've had a quite a rich uh, career, but if I were to come down to one achievement, but I would go El Sabe 1A and 1B, I think one is about people. Uh, people by that, I mean, bringing the voices, for example, of 
um, women leaders who are not being seen on TV or platforms like <coughs> to uh, the kind of work that I'm doing at the higher level. So bringing the stories, like I mentioned from India, the realism of what we do and their voices to the boardrooms, to the meeting rooms, to the platforms that I carry with my role. But linked to people as well is the mentoring. I like growing talent. So everywhere I have worked, my own indicator of my own success is in my brain and using my platform to inspire others so they can do better than me. So that one bucket is the people. Second, it's more linked to my journey uh, that I've done, meaning academia, starting with Liu uh, uh, Center for Global Studies, World Bank, where I worked in public and private sector, UNEP, where I focused on environment. Now I'm on humanitarian uh, role. It's connecting the dots. So instead of looking at, for example, climate justice, climate crisis as a linear problem, thinking what does this mean in the context of development, humanitarian, but also grounded on data. So I have taken upon myself to connect my own professional uh, dots in the spirit of serving a larger purpose by saying, okay, this is a climate change, but it's not just about drought. It's about drought linked to agricultural sector, to, for example, revenues that are coming out of the agriculture sector. So that I consider as the second uh, achievement for me. Over to you. Thank you. Um, yeah, I think the SDGs also show us that everything is in a way interconnected and climate change really is a lens um, which just intensifies um, many of the other challenges that we are already facing. Um, you mentioned that you have a role in mentoring young people and that this is something that's important to you. Um, is there someone who has been a, a role model and an inspiration to you who, yeah, inspires your work? Oh, yes. Uh, I think uh, one, you know, when it comes to my value system, definitely I would say my parents, because uh, value formulation starts at home. So whether it's the issue of respect, integrity, work ethic, definitely my parents. I think professionally, I've had many mentors. I'm a mother of two kids, uh, young adults and professional journey I've had uh, fabulous mentors. Frankly, I'm a huge beneficiary of uh, mentoring, and I feel an obligation of passing it on. But what, who gives me uh, the biggest inspiration, uh, frankly, are my children. I always ask, uh, I have a 23-year-old uh, and almost 18-year-old son, I always ask, when it's all said and done, will they say, aha, uh -huh, mommy did make a difference. So they give me a sense of purpose in everything I do. Over. Thank you so much. That is uh, wonderful. If we have the next generation to inspire us to do our best now. It also helps with that idea of impatience. Uh, you know that what you're doing, even if you don't get the results right now, it will definitely have a long-term impact. Um, I have one more question for you both. Um, so if you could give one piece of advice to young people, your children or um, grandchildren, other young people, uh, particularly women who are aspiring leaders in the climate justice movement, uh, what would that be? I can, I mean, I would- do... Yes, yes, can I? Oh, sorry. Oh, I almost asked myself because I have a slight cold. No, no, please, um, Professor, go. Yes. I'll, I'll you. Oh, yes, yeah, sorry about that. Well, I have more than one advice to these young ladies, but my advice to these uh, three groups of ladies is that once they, they just want to go to, into climate justice, climate education, 
uh, movement of policy. My advice to them is one and the same. And I say that these young women must boldly come forward to be counted in the drive for national, regional, and global climate justice. Again, the backdrop of the vital role of women as gender, uh, majorly responsible for household food production, and so for family health and nutrition and the management of natural resources. And um, particularly, women are the most sensitive to this climate change issue. So, you know, they should come up with this. And let me advise them that capacity building also of themselves is very, very important. They should align themselves with environmental movements and activist organizations working for social and environmental justice to build up their advocacy skills. And, um, you know, I would also advise them to, be serious, to do serious research into the study of, you know, extant principles of climate um, justice. And, uh, you know, they can go online and pull out, um, you know, uh, the Mali principles and the Mary Robinson Foundation climate justice principles. Because how can they do if they don't know what this, what the concepts mean or what is required? So it's very important for them to cap capacity build themselves. They must be knowledgeable. It's very, very important. And as change agents too, they have the unique knowledge and capabilities. They must tap into this and start dreaming of innovative interventions, creative ideas to reduce climate change, uh, you know, and, um, and foster climate justice. For example, you can think of, you know, build up things like carbon. We've had a lot of this efficient cooking stoves, you know, and see ways that we, they can also become entrepreneurs through some of these tools that we need to curb the incidence of um, climate change. They can apply to um, my sister, um, you know, Joyce there, and apply to UNDP, another national international organization for financial and technical support. Also, finally, I think they must be politically savvy. They must start asking their senators or their lawmakers what they are doing to ensure that the government keeps fit with its expressed, you know, national Islamic contributions, okay? And also the recent laws that we have, PIA and, um, you know, the Climate Change Act, you know? And then they must lobby the lawmakers too, to ensure that even at the country level, the most vulnerable to the impact of climate change do not continue to bear the unfair burden of climate uh, uh, change. Because at, even within the, you know, the um, country setting, there is still, you know, uneven distribution of the burden of climate change. So this is what I want these young ones to also look into and see how, you know, the lawmakers can help to see that the point the society are not the ones, you know, I can afford to put, you know, a generator in my house 24 seven, whereas the, you know, the poor guy there would have to resort to um, maybe, um, I mean, that it's just not the adaptation, you know, and mitigation of climate change. In fact, even at the national level, is still unevenly spread. So it's what I've learned. And then finally, they must take on the greater Thunberg effect. But I just a young girl like them. So th let's see how they too can follow in the same vein as, um, as uh, Greta and continue to, uh, you know, inspire a new generation to take a stance on climate change ju justice as a political issue. That's what I would like to see in, in, in the younger ones. Thank you. Thank you, Prof. That was very practical advice um, to study, build capacity, dream, and come forward and be counted. Thank you. Joyce. Thank you, uh, El Sabi. Just to clarify the question, uh, did you want me to speak about advice to young women aspiring to be leaders, period, or leaders in the space of climate justice, education, et cetera? Um, I think the, the focus on, on the climate space, but if you if you have some comments in general, um, then welcome. that's welcome as well. Okay, so I would say um, uh, two things. One is um, I would encourage young women leaders in the climate justice space to do the uncomfortable uh, uh, work slash tasks 
because if you unpack, depending on the context and where um, you are located or at what, whether you're in community or in uh, higher level or in academia or your student, most of these issues are very complicated, but they're also very hard. You may have to deal with the legal system, the governance structure, the policy. You have to mobilize communities to support as part of the climate justice. So I would encourage young leaders in this space not to shy away from difficult things. Because what I have learned as a leader, when you do some of these difficult issues, and push and push and don't give up. You also become a better leader. You're building a stronger leadership muscle, but also you're making a difference because that's what distinguishes, in my view, uh, you know, when the needle shifts. So go for the harder things for a bigger uh, impact. True, I would say, depend on science on data. Uh, it's very easy for people, uh, any community to question things that are not grounded on data. And now the more we are knowing about climate change, climate crisis or climate justice, use numbers. How many people have been negatively impacted by the injustice around climate, for example, because then that becomes a powerful tool. And here, I think the role of students, faculty, academia to help inform public policy, to help push uh, 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 for adv advocating for uh, climate justice is absolutely, absolutely central. So even on advocacy that is grounded on science and data is much, much more powerful than the opposite. So those would be my two advice. Thank you so much uh, for those words of wisdom. Um, I, I think we should now open the floor for some questions uh, from the audience. We have received some in the chat. So I think I will start by reading the first one, uh, which is what is the role of regional organizations such as ECOWAS and the East African community in tackling climate change? And what are their limitations? Um, I don't know if you want to speak about ECOWAS, Prof, and then Joy speaks about the East African community or how you would like to approach this question, but maybe you can go first, Prof. Yeah, let me talk about ECOWAS because um, that is one I've been quite involved with. And I told you that the master team, you know, um, we had, you know, I was um, in charge of the West African, you know, sub region, mainstream education and sustainability into Nigerian universities. And, um, you know, um, we got not just uh, from the university setting, also from NGOs, women, you know, um, CSOs to connect it to the uh, conference that we organized in um, Ileife. This was not in the university, because I know we held it somewhere in, um, in Iloko Ejesha. You know, it was CEDA, so the Swedish, you know, organization agency that, you know, sponsored it for us. And we tried to disseminate it into an entire West African um, region. And I'm sure that, you know, from the um, report I got, some of the West African countries actually, you know, um, you know, took the idea and ran with, with it and actually, you know, um, put structures in place, you know, policies and laws to try and implement it in their own countries. You know, it's only like that, that you know, things uh, take, uh, you know, uh, a longer route, you know, to, to get done or uh, get by. But, you know, at the Ecovas region, we did have some um, headway. We, we made some headway with mainstreaming education and sustainability. That was during the onset, United Nations um, decade for, you know, um, and, and uh, uh, you know, education for sustainable de de development, you know, the period, and we got it done in the Ecovas region. Thank you, I yield. 
Uh, thanks. So, so on um, East African community, um, and when I was in UNEP, we engaged with them. Uh, they do have a role to play as a sub-regional uh, uh, entity. Uh, two ways specifically that we worked with when I was in Nairobi. Um, one is on political advocacy for climate change and climate uh, advocacy, uh, because they bring that regional, sub-regional uh, collective voice um, uh, to different discussions and fora, and they have access that sometimes multilateral organizations may not have in the space of political economy. The second is on training. Uh, together, for example, with the African Development Bank, the training of African negotiators before different COPs uh, to go and bring um, uh, the voices of uh, uh, Africa to these uh, uh, COPs, uh, very important. And that does not just include uh, actors from the state, but also local NGOs. For example, some of the meetings we used to have before the Glasgow COP were, were organized by the East African community. They involved local NGOs and their voices and inputs were feeding up into sub-regional NGOs that were bringing the voices on and up to, 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 to COP in Glasgow. So I can't comment on their limitations. I think they're in much better position to do that than myself, over. Mm -hmm. Thank you, thank you so much. I think what you both confirm is that action is needed at all levels um, and that the regional level can play a very important role. And if I may um, add, sorry, if I may add, sorry, I'm sorry to what you know, that under the auspices of you, you, UNEP, I'm sure maybe just was there then, you know, we, um, you know, we, we, we try and challenge all the re regions, you know, uh, West Africa, East Africa, and SADC to try and, you know, harmonize, you know, the mainstreaming of education and sustainability in, um, in African uh, universities. So there's still this continental, you know, approach towards it apart from the regional ones. We try and harmonize at the continental level too. I know we had meetings in uh, South Africa and was, you know, well attended. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for that comment as well. Um, I think we maybe have time for one or maybe two more questions. One question is from Teboho, who asks, as we all, who says, as we all know, being a woman in itself is a superpower. Your portfolios are a clear indication of our ability to multitask. So on a lighter note, how do you unwind, relax, and achieve a work-life balance? So what do you do? <laughs> oh, thank you. That's a really, really... Mm -hmm question, uh, Tebogo, I think the name is, uh, how do I unwind, relax and achieve the work-life balance? One, I actually manage my work-life balance very carefully, specifically, for example, when my kids were, when our kids were very, very young, I put a little bit of a break on my career because I felt for me and my husband, it was important to focus on the children. So you have to define your own boundaries before letting the institutions or whoever define them for you. And I think sometimes we as women, we, we, we can do better in that. But how do I unwind? One is exercising. Uh, I like to meditate. Uh, you know, I used to do yoga, but now I do a bit of meditation. Uh, and then lastly, I have a very strong core of friends who have known me some as back as when I was in kindergarten and they ground me uh, because when, as you climb up sometimes you know uh, the circle becomes thinner so just enjoying time quality time with family and friends gives me a different energy and frankly it reaffirms my values which get translated directly in the office. So that's how I unwind. Over. Oh, yes, I think I have an interesting one. Well, in my case, you know, I married very late, maybe in my 30s, my mid-30s. So my entire life and my working life, my career life, sort of, you know, 
cocooned with my kids, you know, with the kids upbringing. I remember them going on conferences, Edinburgh, Europe, Canada, everywhere. I take the kids along with me because as a little manager, I felt, oh, I couldn't leave the kids with nannies or even with their daddy. I had to, you know, be very protective. So I grew up, my, my career and that life developed around my kids too. I'm not sure that the kids were very, you know, happy about that. They are now in their 30s. My kids are now in their 30s, but I know that they felt that, oh, mama is too much, you know, but now they all have their, you know, their freedom. So how I unwind these days, I know quality time out with, 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 with friends, mostly going out for dinner. I like going out for dinner, you know, lunch, or even uh, brunch, you know, that's how, you know, and, um, and then exercising. I do that occasionally. And I love the seaside, maybe because I come from Niger Delta and I, do, I also love seaside, you know, uh, visits. You know. That's how I went. Thank you, Nayeel. Thank you so Thank much you. for sharing your, yeah, approaches to work-life balance. And I think that as Prof, um, yeah, as you say, we do things at different ages and that also um, <laughs> impacts on how we manage to negotiate through it. Um, I think we have time for one more question. So there is a question uh, to both presenters. The science of climate change is complicated and oftentimes the message comes as hopeless and despair. How are you able to spread the message of hope and counter some of these narratives? Um, so basically looking to the future, how do we keep the optimism? Like I said, you know, COP26 tried to sound a note of hope, but I doubt if it really succeeded in doing that. Because I still believe that if you don't reach the hearts of people, there's no way you will get it done. You, you know, we are 7 billion in the world today. And I can assure you that less than 2 billion or even 1 billion is conscious of the climate change problem. And I think that this is one thing that we have to really disseminate. We have to get, you know, the issue of climate change to really resound in the hearts and minds of people to know that this is for real. It's only for real among the elites, the educated. I'm sorry to say. Even in the university, I think in the, in the, in the best, sometimes in my, you know, the, the environmental law is an elective course. And maybe I have about 50 students, sometimes 100, depending on the size of the class then. But my company law class, that's about 400 students. And you get this, I, I try to, you know, they they don't, they're not aware. They're not aware. So that's why I think that there should be a connection between sustainability and virtually. And now all the courses we teach in the university are green -ables, from religious studies to the, you know, the, the, the sciences, history, they're all green -able. So we have to try and instill, you know, this consciousness of environmental justice in all the students because they are the ones going out there, let them preach it in their homes, you know, among their friends, and then talking about, you know, you know, uh, hang, hanging out. When you hang out, make it a subject of interest. So that's what, you know, and in fact, that's what mainstream of, you know, was trying to do, mess up. We try and bring, even now to the kindergarten le level, to try and see how we can get little kids to appreciate sustainability and the concept of climate change. Mm. Yeah, I yield. Thank if you. I can just, if I can just ask a follow-up, quick uh, question to that one: Do you find that students in your courses do have a sense of despair about the future? Um, that that there is nothing really we can do anymore, um, or is it more that there is just not you enough know, information? A, in a way, sometimes I'm also an influence that I try to influence and let them know that there's something that they can do about it. So with that take away, they know that they have to continue to make it better. You know, they're not that despair, they know that they have to do something about it. But you know, I'm, I just spoke about gas flaring. Okay, that causes some despair. Let's be frank, in the, you know, in Nigeria, for instance, because you are doing the, 
I mean, you, you cannot be doing something and expect to have a different result. You are spending gas and you say, okay, this, but you know, the government tries to explain it that this is, you know, the main revenue enough for the country. But even then, there's still a way that we can let them know that, you know, this is causing climate change and we can cut down on it. You know, and that's what, you know, what I try to preach to the go go government that look at these oil companies. In their home countries, they do not flag us. I've gone to the home countries of some of these oil companies and I see the way that, you know, the gas is released. And if they, they, they harness the gas, we can start harnessing that, which we have started doing anyway, but not at that rate. A lot of it is still being played. But we can start to harness the gas and also reduce the amount of gas that is being um, fled. You know, thank you. Joyce, uh, if you can give us your view on this last question as well. Thanks. So I, I think for me, I use uh, two or three different approaches. Uh, um, and uh, whoever asked this question is absolutely Kwang, Kwang Du, I think, uh, on point. One is I always try to customize my messages, including the science, to the audience that I'm talking to. You know, students, faculty can absorb big numbers, can absorb very complicated uh, analytics. That's not the case, say, for an average illiterate villager mm -hmm. in some of the countries. So one is understanding the audience and customizing that message to that audience. Now, how do you do it? One is to unpack uh, the data. For example, if IPCC report gives an aggregated data on the impact of uh, gas emissions, then if I'm going to Africa, I would ask, what does this mean for Africa? Can you disaggregate the data? So I'll have my team or my colleagues do that. And sometimes depending on the context, you can even go all the way down to the country level because it's powerful when you bring it down to whoever you're talking to. Two, I always look for examples that are relevant for that context. If I'm in India, if I'm in Burkina Faso, to say climate crisis looks like this in Ouagadougou, for example, in Burkina Faso. So people can say, aha, uh -huh. so when I saw the river drying up or uh, rain not come, this is why. Because in some local languages, you know, I know some languages, there's no translation of climate change, <laughs> for example. So you have to bring it down to that uh, level. Three, I always look for uh, 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 local champions. Could be young people, it could be students, universities, academia, policymakers, or even NGOs or humanitarian agencies that are working in this space. And usually they have their way of communicating. So learning and being humble to say how I lived in Asia, for example, for almost uh, six, uh, almost seven years in China and South Korea. The way of communicating in Asia was very different from North America where I moved from and or from Africa where I come from. So I had to learn the nuances of the local culture to be able to communicate very complicated science. Over to you. Thank you. Thank you so much um, to both of you. I think we have reached the end of our discussion for today, um, but you have been so generous in sharing with us from your extensive experience. Um, and I think we all go away inspired and motivated to continue fighting the good fight. Um, so yeah, thank you for taking the time to be here with us this, e this evening, morning, depending on where we are. Um, I will now hand the floor back to Nelly, uh, who will make some concluding remarks. Thank you so much. Uh, I feel inspired and hopeful from listening to and learning from you uh, and from your respective journeys, uh, Professor Margaret, Joyce, and also you as happy. Uh, and I, I think we, we all are honored to have you today and to have listened to you on a Friday. Uh, so, so definitely a good way to wind, uh, wind on the week. Uh, 
So I'll just tie together a few of what we've we've talked about and and what I've what I've had um, and I'll just summarize it and say that as citizens of planet Earth, we all have our part to play in contributing to net zero emissions yeah. and preserving the climate ecosystem. The climate crisis is not just about drought or famine or floods. Everything is interconnected. Mm -hmm. So until we achieve climate justice, let's continue to champion for sustainable practices in our homes, in our workplaces, in our classrooms, in all and every space. So on behalf of the organizing UBC teams, that's the Liu Institute Network for Africa, Gender Plus uh, in Research at ORIS and the School of Public Policy and Global Affairs. We're also grateful for you, our audience that has made time to join us today in celebrating Professor Margaret and Joyce. Um, and just to uh, come back to the housekeeping details, this recording will be available on our websites and social media channels. So as we think about our respective roles in advancing climate justice and humanitarian action, I leave you with the words of the late Professor Wangare Madai, who was the first African woman to win the Nobel Peace Prize in 2004, where she said, in the course of history, there comes a time where humanity is called to shift to a new level of consciousness, to reach a higher moral ground. A time when we have to shed our fear and give hope to one another. That time is now. We are called to assist the earth to heal her wounds and in the process, heal our own, end quote. So I wish you all a great morning, evening and night and weekend ahead. You're free to live at your own pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.